Oh, this is my quick hits. I did something on a Kavanaugh recently. Just put that up finally. We can we can go there if you want. We can talk about it. Yeah, I'm, I've got energy around it, that's for sure. Energy in which way? That kind of energy. <laughs> <laughs> It's like your your total inside gut is like I'm so angry. Yep, pretty much. That I need to. It's a guttural. It is reaction. It's guttural. You have guttural reactions. Yeah. To Kavanaugh. Well, Why don't you, you tell me about him? <laughs> I don't know him personally. Oh yeah, <laughs> thank God, not, not him. <laughs> but you, uh, you obviously your insides have a, a feeling about it. Yeah. My, my video was uh, simply like, if this was a job interview, mm-hmm. like I wouldn't get the job. Mm. Right, because yeah, like I'm totally. crying. I'm yelling at the people, uh-huh. and so I don't get the job. That's it. Yeah. Yet he gets the he gets the job. I, I I imagine myself in that position all the time since it happened, and I was like, yeah, I go into a job, and then they say, well, excuse us, but we we have received this report from someone that that you have sexually assaulted them, and I go, no, no, I did not sexually assault them. <laughs> no, you, uh, uh, and then they're like, you know what? I believe you. Yeah. You're great for this job. Yeah, never mind. And like never in a million years. I mean, I think. In most situations, that would not happen to anybody. Not no. just because I'm a woman, but in general. I in think general. That would, especially because I'm a woman. But, like, in general, I would think. Right. Oh, like, she's she's uh, crazy. You know, she's... Yeah. Um, like, you don't have the temperament to be professional. Temperament. That's just unprofessional. Yeah. Hysterical, I was going to say. Yes, hysterical, you know I mean? shrill. Oh, hysterical, yeah. yeah and yet he was hysterical. Like yeah, he was hysterical and shrill. And, and and mean. I, I brought up too mean. Like like if I like stopped someone and said like no 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 listen I'm gonna tell you what's going on. Yeah. Oh well then you don't get to work here. Right. Exactly. And then especially when you start turning questions around back on the interviewer. Oh then yeah. Then they'd be like, excuse me, I think we're done here. But no, they were just like, oh, okay. Oh look at this poor guy. Well now isn't some of that on them too though? Right. Yeah. Can't some of these people on this you know the high court go like listen. You don't get to do this kind of stuff. Right. Like, beep, 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 beep. You yeah. know, just nip them in the butt and say, we're, we're done here. Exactly. Yeah, they should have. They should have been like, excuse me, I'm not like when that woman, I can't remember her name, um, who he ended up like harassing her almost like, right. well, what about you? Did you ever get drunk and black out? Did you? Oh my like, goodness. I'm surprised she didn't stop and go, excuse me, sir, I'm not the one being questioned here. You are. No one said and that. Nobody said it. Like, that's the most basic statement to say. Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, well, Deep that's breaths. our Kavanaugh thing. Deep grumbles in our insides. Yeah. Lauren Hall Steigerts is here. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. We did a podcast last. What was that for? Was it Video Game Break? Yeah, Video Game Break. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you can look that up on the Googles, you'll find it. It was, it was a podcast they did for about video games. Yeah. Um, this is a lot of things, and we talk about a lot of things, like Kavanaugh and whatever else. I uh, met you through Big Fish Games. Mm-hmm. You were writing for their blog. Yes. And you had written before then. Yes. And writing is something you like doing still? My my background is marketing communications. And right. then by way of that, SEO. And by way of like learning SEO, also creating content with like an SEO mm. focus. So that's how I... And I ended up um, getting to contract with Big Fish Games because... A former marketing director there knew me from another job that I had before. And so he pulled me in, and I just got to write for the blog a lot. Yeah, it was cool. I loved all your articles. And Thank you. I love writing, but I feel like I'm not a good long-form writer. Mm-hmm. I'm like good short-form stuff. Um, this is the only exception because we're just talking. Mm-hmm. And it's like becomes a long thing. But I like the if I'm writing, I feel like I like the short bits. Yeah. But you were really good at like long exposition of like explaining stuff, I feel like. Thanks. I am extremely detail oriented and extremely thorough. So often I'd have to trim back a lot of my blog posts so I could get them to around fifteen hundred words as opposed to, you right. know, twenty eight hundred words. Right. Twenty eight hundred is a lot. I, I think the longest post I ever wrote for Big Fish Games was I think about thirty two hundred words. What was it on? Oh, God, I can't remember. It was one of those, like, heavily researched to prove a point. Um, I can't remember. Right. But, but you proved the point. 3,200 yeah. words, you proved the point. Yeah. 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 I think that stuff is interesting because, uh, not to sidestep a little bit, but when it comes to the Internet and ADHD um, society right now, mm-hmm. um, I wonder how many people read stuff on the Internet. 
I know. I wonder that too. Like, do you much? Right. Exactly. I love reading. I love reading too, but I actually hate reading on any electronic device because I have to look at electronic devices a lot for work and for researching. And that if I have a choice between a book and a a screen, I would much rather read a book. Right. I have one here today we're going to talk about later. I I was going to ask you about it, but I thought we're going to talk about it on the podcast. We will talk about it on the podcast. (laughs) Um, Yeah. so, So we met there at Big Fish and- uh, and then you, at some point, went off to do a bunch of stuff, including having a child. Yes. And that's a whole thing. Mm-hmm. Quinn. Her name's Quinn. Her name's Quinn, yeah. And she's super smart, we've decided. <laughs> well, I think she's super smart, but I am like 100% biased. You are, because you're the mom. Yeah. Uh, but I think she's super smart, because she knows what, or she was interested in what a diode was. Uh-huh. So that's, I mean, that's and something. She she immediately repeated it back to me, and then what was the word that she used today? I can't even remember now, but I she repeated a word back to me. And Was I it went... quantum physics? Was her word quantum physics? <laughs> Did you say, hey, mom, let's <laughs> talk about quantum physics? <laughs> it, was, it was like a four-syllable word that I was, she was just like first time she ever heard it and she just said it right back to me i was like that's amazing do you think kids are smarter now do you think they're mm. getting smarter with the technology everybody understands like there's like a device that can tell them stuff you know they grow up with the technology earlier not necessarily i think that their brains are just getting wired differently mm. and i think you know a kid a kid's intelligence or the ability to acquire knowledge like that has to do with genetics as well as how much they're exposed to language early on so um, after my daughter was born I talked to her a lot like all the time because I'm a talker I'm I'm here on the podcast hey "Hey, let's not like talk about something for 45 minutes let's talk about lots of little things because this is called a lot of things it is (laughs) I could sit here for two hours talking about my daughter and so I would make sure I just talk all the time to my newborn like this is what I'm doing here's Mm. what I'm making what do you think of it and she couldn't say anything and so I feel like that was a part of how like her language acquisition and being able to process thought and emotion and, yeah yeah you know. it was going in and she just didn't have any like external ways to say something to you about it exactly but it was still going in yes and now it's all starting to come out <laughs> yeah yeah she's like what's a diode i want to know pretty much um so you had the kid and then you um did tea i remember going like okay you've always enjoyed tea but you're like i'm seriously getting into tea yeah so like that's part of your whole life right now tea yeah. business yeah i i so related to what you're talking about here, um, a friend posted on Facebook today that at her work, there was an icebreaker question. What job would you be doing now um, if you weren't here? And, like if you had any choice in um, like travel and money and education had like no weight on, mm-hmm. on it. And so I, I wrote in the comments, um, I would do all the things with tea and not any tea. Like I guess I should be specific. Traditional tea single origin Mm -hmm. camellia sinensis words i don't know but yes Yes, like (laughs) like uh, when we think of tea in america we often think of tea bags with the little powder and it ends up tasting bitter you steep it once and you toss it and whatever it's just to get you going yeah but um i'm really into traditional tea from china taiwan and japan Um, as well as some upcoming countries like Africa um, or continents, Africa. Many countries in Africa are starting to get into tea production. So it's very fascinating to see these other countries get into classic tea production, even though they're brand new comers. So so they haven't really gotten into that world of tea, like it wasn't a thing for them, is what you're saying? It wasn't. Now they're seeing that there's a market for it, and so they have the right climate, and they're all trying their hand at it. Oh, interesting. From I'm not, I'm no expert on, you know, like these new up and coming, like Vietnam um, has been growing tea for a while, but they've never been like a primary player like China and Japan have been. And, um, but I can, you can taste the difference between, I think, from the teas that I've had from these up and coming countries and the, the the countries that have hundreds or a thousand years of growing tea, right. you know, so they, they have some, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's still fun. It's still fun. So I guess the the short answer to that, what would I be doing? I would be having, a, I would have a tea farm. I would do tea production. I would have a tea blog. I would be a tea buyer for companies. I would have a tea a tea shop. I like just anything I could do with tea. So what is uh, what does tea do for you? Because I always feel like you know um, we. 
have talked about this, I think, before, but this, let's say society, but also this country is very addictive. You know, we, we like our um, addictive things that we do. We like our mm-hmm. stimulants. And whether that's coffee, which I'm drinking right now, which we'll talk about the mug that I have in a minute, mm-hmm. um, or it's cigarettes or whatever you're doing. Uh, so tea does that stuff, but in my mind, it just does it healthier, right? Like, this, right. It, it, what do you get out of it? I mean, like, the black tea gives you the caffeine so you can keep doing stuff, but what, what do you get out of tea, you personally? It's a good question. I'd say that the what got me into tea originally was back in 2007, I was taking the Japanese tea ceremony class offered at the University of Washington. Mm. Because I'm just generally into Japanese culture, not because of the tea. I was like, well, I don't really like green tea because my mom would use those crappy tea bags from the grocery right. store. And they always taste like bitter and crappy. And so I'm like, I don't like green tea, but okay, we'll do this. And so in the Japanese tea ceremony, you drink a bowl of matcha. And for people who are unfamiliar with matcha or have only had it at Starbucks as a latte, traditional matcha is just ground green tea leaves whisked into hot water and drank straight up. And it's nothing cut in it no milk or anything yeah. no sugar and um it's 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 intense but a good pleasant sweet intense and so um i went and did this but and i was like wow okay so this drink is actually really good and i didn't know tea could taste this good and make me feel this good but the overall theme that i think drew me into tea was the culture of it right and the way you prepare it and stuff right like the the mindfulness that goes into ceremony it. almost yeah the ceremony yeah it's meditative it's um you have to be mindful you have to be present then i mean we could sit here and talk an, an hour about the principles of of that are built into the japanese tea ceremony yeah. about um wake seijaku those are the four principles harmony tranquility respect and purity i was gonna say that yeah totally yeah, yeah, I, you know, it rolls off the tongue i remember it all the time ichigo ichie one one time one place this will oh. never happen again this is a unique opportunity so you need to be completely oh, present like in this moment where yeah. you're here talking we'll never be able to replicate this again oh my gosh i'm just reminded of karate kid part two <laughs> Do you remember Karate Kid Part 2? No, I don't remember it specifically. He, he was in Japan, and they had he had a Japanese girlfriend, and she's like, we're going to do this tea ceremony, and it's really intimate, <gasps> and it's a really big, and there was a thunderstorm outside. Oh, my God, that sounds magical. Oh, my goodness, it is. That's exactly what You should YouTube it. it. Everybody listen to YouTube that, that scene. I'm going to find it. Yeah, and it's like this like moment. It was like, this is never going to happen. Like, we're doing this thing together. And he was from yeah. America, and she's from Japan, and it was like this... Yeah. So so to answer your question, like that's what got me into tea originally was this like intention around it and the ceremony. It's a private ceremony or to share it intimately with another person. Right. And, and it's rooted in this beautiful human spirituality. And um and I then I just got into other tea and it tastes delicious and But yeah. do you get the high you get highs from it? Do you feel like it like kind of gives you a little oomph too? Yeah, and it depends on the quality of the tea. So right. tea bags are gonna give you nothing, right? Right. Like, it's just crap. It's just yeah, like yeah. I need a hit of caffeine, and that's it. And so you could get tea high from caffeine, which you could get from a Anything. tea bag. Yeah. You know, and then there's a tea high that you can get. It's called chaki, and which is um, tea high, like key, like chi energy, right? Oh yeah. And it's more of like um, I'm gonna get all metaphysical now with it, but please. It's, it's it's what's built into the tea by the producer who has gone through all these steps and the farmers oh. who have cultivated it. They can cultivate it to have a certain kind of energy. And, you know, there's people who say that that's just a bunch of bunk and whatever. But then there's the people who really feel it. And you, you can't. It's like you don't believe in it until you feel it. And it makes you feel... Like transcendent. Yeah. I mean, that happens with food, right? Like you have a like person who's producing something for you in the kitchen. They're making something with their energy. That's why they always say make it with love, you know? Mm-hmm. there's a, You feel that. It's different than like a process thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I believe that. It takes you to another plane. You yeah. Know? It's like, wow. I need to do more tea in my life. Yeah. So, uh, tea it up. Uh, didn't you, don't you work somewhere local? Do you still do that stuff local? Yeah, yeah. I do uh, a little uh, consulting work with CC Fine Tea formerly known as Smacha Tea, but um, they used to have a retail shop in Bellevue that was absolutely beautiful. But Jason Chen is the owner and founder. He's from Taiwan. Okay. Um, but he's super into bringing high-quality tea to people affordably, and 
Uh, I love his mission. I love, I, I'm, I'm indebted to him for how much he, knowledge he has imparted on me for Chinese and Taiwanese tea. And right. um, it's just kind of like a family. So I help them out with order fulfillment, email marketing, um, a little SEO, some content. Cool. Yeah. And do they have a, uh, so they still have a location though in Seattle or no? Not a retail location. Oh, okay. They have a warehouse in Bellevue. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I like the idea of, um, I guess, tea houses, right? Like, that's a thing. Mm-hmm. Like people go and chill out and have these different kind of teas. Because again, if you just go in the store, you're gonna get this processed BS. That's not right. What you really want to do? Exactly. I I would love to have um, a tea shop, but I'd want it to be a traditional Chinese tea shop. Where you that's know, that's the future. Maybe that's what's in your future. <sighs> but I don't think that there's a market for it big enough to support the um, retail um, tenant. Here's what leases. you do. Here's what you do. You add like some element like music venue or you add something else with it right because then people mm-hmm. come for different reasons you know they're like oh it's this really cool tea place and you have this amazing tea but also there's like these great <laughs> acoustic acts or something it's like, you just re- you saying that reminded me yeah that's a great idea it also reminds me of the beginning of um what's that um la la land did you oh, I didn't see it. I know okay, it. so there's there's a scene where the guy, the jazz guy, pianist, he wants to open up a like a jazz bar, like a classic jazz bar, and it takes place in in modern day. But he's got this old soul that loves like 1930s and 40s jazz, and and so he in 60s maybe 1960s, and so he wants to open up a bar, and then he goes to this location where he envisions or a perfect jazz club, and there's already a jazz club there, but it's jazz and tapas, and he's oh, like, no. what are you? Are you jazz or are you? You top us. You can't be both jazz and top us. Pick one. God damn it. He got so mad. That's so he was, awesome. He just said, tea or music? Are you tea, tea or music? music? Are you tea music or what? <laughs> You're both. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah. do tea music. Let's do it. Yay. Tea and tapas. How about tea and tapas? <gasps> Tapa right. teas. Tea and tea. That just got really complicated it trying did. to pair all that together. Speaking of tea, I'm drinking a mocha for the video if you are watching the video. And it is a ember cup that I'm using. Ooh. That I've teased last episode. I got uh, this cup from the guys over at Ember, which is awesome. E M B E R. Check it out. They also have a thermos, which you can actually dial the the bottom of it to change the temperature. This one you use. Uh, it's a mug, and it used a smartphone app. So I've set this before our podcast to warm up my mocha at 145 degrees, and it is piping hot. It's wow. perfect. Uh, it's great sippable. Let me sip it on the. And it's just so crazy to me. It's so funny. Yeah. Oh. That um It's warm but not It's not painful. yeah, but like not painful. Hurt. It's like perfect drinking temperature. It's perfect. And what's funny is that like you I've had many mochas where, you know, you're doing something playing video games, working on internet stuff. Yeah. And you just okay, okay, now it's cold. Right. I'll just drink it cold because I don't want to waste it. Right. This one, it's just not getting cold. Or if you go put it in the microwave, you can never get it back. Uh, it ruins it. It ruins it. Yeah. You're right about that. It literally, you like either leave it on too long uh-huh. and it's like piping hot and it, it tastes different. It does. It, like something separates in there and just it tastes I weird. I think that's a thing. Mm-hmm. Again, we're talking about energy and, and tea. The same thing with coffee and mochas and stuff. Right. It's like when it was first prepared and first made, which, by the way, so many mochas are made with love. They do that <laughs> yeah. thing in the top That's and everything. Right, with all the artwork. They really, and I always feel bad when like they just put the lid on it. I'm like, never mind. Oh. You know, you feel like, I oh, know I want to look at it for a minute. Yeah. Take a picture of it. That's right. Um. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that it's made with love, and you. The this is a great advertisement for the company, but you can like keep the love in your mocha. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> they we, should. We guys use that. <laughs> hey, pay you for I'm that. That was really good. How do you clean it? I like a like a regular cup. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It's just the bottom that has the conductive heat thing. Okay. And then you can uh, put this on a little uh, saucer, and oh. that's the charger. Oh. Oh, yeah, okay. That's really great. cool. So anyways, uh, check out Ember Mugs, and it's Ember. I can look up the website. I yeah, don't I have it. I was just going to ask, where can we find these? And I'll just type it right mugs. now. It's... Maybe not. I will have to put it on my Christmas wish list. It is Ember.com. Ember Mug. Control your temperature. Hey, Ember. SEO. I'm impressed with that URL. <laughs> there you go. I know, right? It's hard to do nowadays. Yeah, but they spend a lot of money on that URL. Oh, now, here's the thing. Yeah. Is every good URL, you just have to buy it then? You have to just be like, okay, who, someone owns it. Someone's parking on it. Most likely. And you're spending thousands and tens of thousands or of dollars. Or you're waiting for somebody to vacate, and then you hop on it. But I think that there's a lot of businesses that have um, software that tells them when these really popular oh, URLs. right. Like, I really wanted 
lauren.com and that ended up expiring and some other company took it and squatted on it and right. I was like, yep, not buying that and going to spend $20,000 for lauren.com? No. <laughs> I mean, that seems like a sought after one. That's like a... Like maybe know, more than 20000 <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm going to see what it is now because let's see, yeah. lauren.com. Oh, it's a thing. Is it it's, a company? Yeah, it's a company. It's okay. Lauren Manufacturing. Okay. They Okay, hold on. They solve the toughest ceiling challenges. One innovation at a time. Ceiling challenges. They're a single source supply partner for materials of ceiling things. Interesting. There's yeah. all sorts of things in the ceiling, though. So no, not like I like like ceiling oh, things oh. closed. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm like trying to picture, but yeah, but there's lights up there. Up there. Like, you know who's always up in oh, the ceiling? Oh, ceiling. S E A. We control the ceiling. <laughs> it's S E A L. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anywho, what's the difference a C makes? Uh, let's talk about other things, including uh, I, what are you into right now? What, what entertainment are you into? Oh, yeah. Per good the question. podcast. Um, Outlander. Everybody's talking about Outlander. Oh, good. I'm so glad. My roommate just mentioned it to me. I need to check it out. Why should I check out Outlander? Okay, that's a good question. So, my best friend recommended it to me, and she's been talking about it constantly. And I've always thought of it as, oh, it's a historical romance. I'm really not into historical romance, like Snooze Fest. I'm not into it. And she said, no, you just have to check it out. And so I started to watch the first episode, which, by the way, I got the DVD from my local library because I want to support my local library. What? We talked about that, I think, in a recent podcast, and people were like, oh, yeah, I remember going back to my library and doing that. It still yeah, happens. It still happens. You could get all sorts of great DVDs and for free as opposed to buying it. And I know it's really convenient on Amazon, but like, I really like having the DVD and looking at the special edition Feature stuff. Feature stuff, yeah. But I don't love it enough where I'm going to go and drop the money to just have the DVD. So, right. so anyways, um, I watched the first episode and I'm like, this is produced really well. And you, you, you get captivated. So, so I'm just talking like, and people might not even know what Outlander is. So Outlander, um, is about a woman from, uh, she's, she's in the 1940s. It's 1945. She just ended her, um, tenure as a nurse in World War II, England. She's from England. Okay. And, uh, and her husband was also in the war. And so they finally both come back together as a married couple, but five years down the road. And so they want to re rekindle and learn who they are after this, um, you know, life altering experience. And so they go on uh, kind of like a second honeymoon to Scotland. Um, and her husband is a bit of a history buff. And so he's trying to look back into his past and they go and visit um, the Highland locales. And so she is magically transported somehow back to um, Scotland, 1740. Six or Whoa. 1742 or something like that. Okay. And uh, Scotland is under siege by the English who are trying to take Scotland under, you know, as a, as, you know, extension of England. And um, so this is just before their giant uprising in 19, uh, 1747. Six forty-seven. I'm learning a lot about Scot Scottish history now. I had no idea about this stuff. Right. Some of the shows that are have fantasy in them can bring history as well. Exactly, and it's yeah, extremely yeah. accurate from what I understand. Like, and the woman who wrote the novel, she started um, her her career as a, a research scientist. So okay. she's got the research chops, and she decided to become a fiction writer. And so, anyways, like this, um, I'm not spoiling anything because this is all in the first couple episodes. But um, this nurse ends up getting trans transported to the past and she's like oh my god I have to survive she gets picked up by a Scottish clan um, and then she ends up finding this man named Jamie who's a Scottish Highlander and he's got a price on his head by the English and by the way like the the top captain in that area is um happens to be the great ancestor of her husband and he turns out to be a completely despicable horrible human being oh. and so he, he's after the head of this Jamie guy that she's now connected to and so anyways it's just fascinating watching this story play out I see a lot of potential like romantic things going on with this show is that right too like yes the drama of like oh and then that's part of my my husband, though, I don't know. Exactly. Is so she's that... looking. She's like, oh, my God. It looks, Of course, he looks just like her husband. Oh, of and course. Then, Is it the same actor? Same actor. Oh. Yeah, it's the guy who plays, uh, I can't remember his name, from Game of Thrones, the kind of blackfish 
smarmy, icky guy that ends up inheriting like the. I can't remember. It's been a couple of years since I yeah, watched yeah. Game of Thrones. There's a lot of despicable people in Game of Thrones. <laughs> there is. Yeah, so, so take speaking your pick. of Game of Thrones, that Outlander was created, I think, um, as something that could be marketed against Game of Thrones. It's right. kind of in the same vein. There's a lot of violence. Uh, unfortunately, there's uh, there's a bit of sexual violence, but there's not as much as Game of Thrones. Yeah, because that one can go to hell. I, I, yeah. I've, been, I've said it on the record on this podcast. Don't care at all for Game of Thrones, and mm-hmm. I don't care who listens uh, to that statement and has a problem with it. Yeah. Um, they just went way beyond for no good reason. Too far. Uh, yeah, too far, and it just doesn't make any sense. And it was also beyond even what the books did at times. So I'm like, well, mm-hmm. you're just doing that for show. Exactly. Um, but I am reminded of a better uh, series that is actually pretty good. It's not great, but it's pretty good. It's Britannia. Oh. So Britannia has one of the guys uh, from Walking Dead, who's also a douchebag in Walking Dead, and he plays a good douchebag in this series. But it's also that thing where it doesn't go too far with the sexual violence. It doesn't go too far with the gore. Good. It has moments of it, like anything would have. Right. But it, it like it, it will turn the corner and be like, hey, that happened, and now I have to show you. Right. right. That's all I ask from these shows. Because, yeah. yeah, like, I'm obviously crazy stuff happens in the world, but we don't need to, like, re- like revel in it. Yeah, it was almost just, like, gr- gratuitous. Gratuitous. It was gratuitous, perfect, yeah. yeah. So I think Britannia doesn't do that, and it sounds like uh, Outlander doesn't do that either. Right. I mean, it does take it to some discomfort levels, but just enough to what you need to understand the story of right. what's happening. So, yeah. So, anyways, I'm really enjoying Outlander way more. And then I found out that the producer and um, some of the actors, well, no, actually not the actors. It was the producer. He produced um, Balsar Galactica. Which, Whoa! Yes. You've made my ears perk up more than they already were. Yes. You will. So, I I, I was like, I don't like I don't like sci-fi. My friend was like, you have to watch Balsar Galactica. And as you know, too, Balsar Galactica is fantastic, even if you mm-hmm. don't like sci-fi. It is fan-freaking-tastic. And he produced Outlander. Okay. I'm, I'm going to give it another try because I definitely feel like when I first heard of it, people said they liked it because of the romancy stuff. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, I like it because it's, you know, historical, but it's also got like, I don't know what's going to happen between him and her. And I don't. I'm not going to sign up for a show for that. Yeah. But if it's good in general, and also if it's historical, I love learning things. Um, I love the Vikings. Have you seen the Vikings? Oh, I haven't. But my friend who recommended Outlander also loves Vikings. Yeah. Vikings (laughs) is also similar where, yes, the Vikings did rape and pillage and they did bad stuff. They don't show a lot of stuff. They allude to some things. Some people, some Vikings, like really happened in the real world, didn't want to do that. They're like, well, what are you doing, Jerry? Get out of here. Right, right. I always pick Jerry as the name. <laughs> we did a show once, and Jerry was supposedly over there. And he's like, I was like, Jerry, get out of the corner. Stop fucking with the wires and stuff. Um, I don't know why I always pick Jerry. 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 It's kind of a Ooh. funny name. And by the way, our third guest in the podcast, who we have to uh, <laughs> We, like, have, we have to announce recognize the second. The, yeah, the, the second. third guest, or your second, second guest, guest, is uh, your stomach. Yeah. Because, my stomach and my gut. Yeah, it has, um, it's got, well, let's call it a name. Have you ever called it something? No, I've never named my gut. <laughs> let's but do it on the show. I feel like I need to name all the different gut parts since I'm intimately familiar with the different gut parts. I have Crohn's disease, and that's an inflammatory bowel disease where your guts think that they're being attacked, but they're really not, and so they'll inflame. And um, I have it under control with um, with medication um, and infusion once every eight weeks. I sit in a chair for two and a half hours with Whoa, drugs going Whoa, that long? In. Oh, yeah. my goodness, I didn't know that. They have, they have to slowly drip it in over two and a half hours because my body could react if it just gets flooded. It's a lot of it, yeah. Because it's, um, it's an immunosuppressant. So my body could be like, whoa, 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 what's can, going on my immune system? Can we, can we tell it to stop? Like, how do, why can't we tell it to say, no, this isn't the deal? Like, why does it still go like, no, I'm going to think this way, like, for good? Yeah, it's, I think, well, they don't know exactly what it is. They say it's genetic or it's environmental or it's, um, I have a feeling it could be being exposed to certain things in your food over a long period of time. That's what I think. I'm absolutely no, but I think that that's what it was. I'm just so frustrated because you know about Flint, right? Yes. The drinking water. Yeah. Yeah. And again, people who are listening, uh, Flint still doesn't have clean drinking water, and we're human beings, civilized human society, and we're allowing Flint, Michigan, not to. The wealthiest, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And it's stupid. And it's all over greed and power and the idea that they created a separate pipeline 
for good water when they had a f- perfectly fine pipeline of water. Yeah. Re- I'm not going to go into it too much. Research it for yourself because that's all I want people to do to listen to the show. Mm-hmm. And and figure out how to fucking do something about it. Wow, I don't know all the details, but that sounds I know some despicable crazy and horrible. Yeah, there's a lot of despicable details. But Ugh. that being said, uh, those kids in uh, different parts of Flint have lead poisoning. It's horrible. Uh, and that's something that you can't get rid of because it kind of stunts your growth and kind of in you, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it's just interesting that our bodies, I just wish we could, like, have, we have so much technology and we have so much stuff that we'll talk about in a minute here uh, in science and quantum physics and, and physics that you would think we'd be able to literally change the properties mm-hmm. of certain things like that seem simpler, like your gut. Mm-hmm. It seems simpler, right? It's not like moving the stars and stuff. You know, it's not rocket ships and stuff. But at the same time, we still can't figure out, like, fuck cancer. Yeah. Right? Like a couple of these things you think like, can we just get it? Yeah, I know. And now I, I'm a Debbie Downer. I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. I I was thinking, I know it's like kind of conspiracy theory like, but then there's entire industries that are making money on hoping that we get a solution one day. And if we have a solution, then they're out of business. Yeah, they're out of business. That's a whole other. Discussion. That's a whole other. Yeah, it's conspiracy. Let's theory-ish. talk about other things. So Outlander's <laughs> good. Everybody should yes. check out Britannia because I think that's actually a pretty good series. Um, check that out too. And a Vikings. So there's three shows that are all in the same vein, actually, and all of them have less terrible darkness than Game of Thrones, Yay. which I despise. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I was going to ask you a question, because I have a lot of new music that I've been checking out. Hmm. I'm going to talk about some of it, but how do you find music? Oh, that's a good question. Because in this new era, like, it's a different thing, but at the same time, I feel like it's still difficult. Yeah. So I I don't really listen to radio anymore. Right. My favorite radio stations don't really exist. Um, I uh, I will embarrass myself by saying I love smooth jazz and I love the smooth jazz radio station that is long gone. Um, and but you also play jazz. I play jazz. Yeah, I don't play smooth jazz myself, but I play uh, clarinet and saxophone and um, some crappy flute. But <laughs> that's just on the side. <laughs> it's on the side. Like yeah. I'm barely learning. But how you're to... like clarinetist. You're like a. Yeah. Is that what it's called? A clarinetist. Yeah. Is it? Uh, yeah, a clarinetist. Would okay, cool. Be the, I just like, thought I made that word up. No, no, that's what you call right. it. Saxophonist, clarinetist, but I'm okay. primarily clarinet, and then um, I learned tenor and alto saxophone along the way. And um, yeah, so if you want to find new jazz, how you find it? You're not, you're I, not find new jazz. I go on Spotify. Right. And they have curated, algorithmically curated lists right. that will play new music for you, and then you're like, oh. So what category on, I was going to say most of my stuff is through Spotify now too, mm-hmm. uh, and the stuff I'm, one of the bands I'm going to talk about today is from that. Um, how do you, which part of Spotify do you go to? Because they have like your daily top mixes, they have like browse, they just have new releases. Yeah. Is there something you go to specifically? or? Oh, my favorite used to be the weekly discovery playlist that would like curate all new stuff that you haven't heard based on your tastes. Right. And um, it would be 30 songs a week. But I had to stop listening to that because the algorithm for that is several months or a year slow. And it picked up on all of the like meditation and sleep oh, right. sleep aid music that uh-huh. I was listening to constantly to go to sleep um, like a year and a half ago. Totally. And I stopped and like and it took a year for it to catch up and now all it's doing is just playing yoga, meditation, yeah. sleep music and I'm like, I can't change it. I just have to wait for the algorithm to update in a year. <laughs> yeah. You know? So anyways, I, I missed that so much. That was my primary list but I can't listen to it anymore. Weekly release is really good. So it's a radar. I think it's called Weekly Radar or something. Weekly yeah, Radar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's good. Unfortunately, sometimes it gets overpopulated with these like singles from electro bands that you might kind of listen to because those singles come out so much, but right. no album. I was going to say that. Like, I feel like when we grew up, uh, we're in the ballpark of age, similar, um, yeah. there was cassette singles, uh, uh, or at least there was when I was... As soon as I said that, I was like, maybe not. Um, <laughs> but there were singles, but they, were, they weren't they were really a, uh, they were not that huge of a thing. I feel like with Spotify, with the idea of digital, we can like have so many more singles mm-hmm. because you're just like, oh yeah, I just made this thing with, you know, we did a collaboration and we put it out and, and Spotify has tons of them. I feel like I, every time I hear a new song or see on my radar, I see something and it's just a single. It's not a, it's not an album. 
Yeah. Because there's so many of them. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, and then I get really disappointed when I hear something I love, and then I go, go to the album, and it's like, oh, it's, it's like, a no, single. There's, yeah, there's yeah, just yeah. one song on there, but yeah, that's how I'm finding. And then they have their curated, where they just have the themes on your emotion or holiday or whatever you can listen to what they've put together yeah um that actually happened with me perfect segue i was listening to my radar or one of my you know things on spotify that said here's new music for you and i found petite biscuit petite biscuit Biscuit, uh the song was also with uh someone else i forgot who it was but it was like kind of a collaboration yeah and it's electronica but also female vocalist and that's just pretty much my favorite thing in the world wow that mixture yeah um I think Portis Head, but like oh, stronger, like, like a faster and more dubstepy, oh. but still that kind of soulful Portis Head. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then I was like, okay, she had. I went to her, you know, the single, but it was two songs, like a glorified EP kind of or a short EP. Yeah. And then she did have a record that was uh, 1997, so there was one there. But lots of times I'll go to a place in Spotify and they'll say, oh, there's just a one or two songs and. Uh, but Petite Biscuit is my pick Petite for Spotify. Petite Biscuit. Yeah. I'll have to go and check that out. Yeah. I, I sometimes want to play it on here, but then I don't know how much it comes into the trouble with the copyright. Cause oh, yeah, that's true. It's and, silly. Well, one that I can say, I guess I didn't just discover them, but um, new album out, um, C... Oh, gosh, now I can't remember his name because it's like C with a number after it, like C-148, I think. What? He created, he's a, just a guy from England, and he um, made the soundtrack for Minecraft, and that's how he got famous. What? Which I wasn't too familiar. I didn't play Minecraft. Um, but then I've listened to his other things that he released himself. It's just like really um, deep, intense electronica really good mm. very like moody um beautiful dreamscapey so there's that and then on the other end of things i can also recommend wolfpeck v u l f p e c k whoa and they are upbeat funk modern funk jazz fusion group okay very bass heavy um, like string bass and yeah, and electronic bass. bass. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they're they are so much fun. It's just like four guys from L.A. or something. What was they, it called again? Wolfpack. V u l f p e c k. It's like Wolfpack, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. All right, check that out. Uh, also, Tom. Speaking of bass, Tom Morello of Rage Against Machine has a record out on Spotify now. <gasps> I've been starting to listen to a lot of Rage Against the Machine oh, lately because I'm feeling like fight the system fight right the now. Fight the system. We'll yeah! that. Fuck yeah. Yeah, I'm really feeling it. <laughs> that was just a moment. We just had to like, here's the thing. A lot of, uh, I'll say Americans, are having that feeling. They're like, what do we do? I don't know. I have to yell. I'm just go ah! <laughs> what you should do is watch Agretsuko, a great anime. That was a great transition into that. Yeah, <laughs> with a little kitty, and she does karaoke and sings death metal. If you want a little release, just watch that show. It's on Netflix right now. Yep, that's right. That's she's, another thing to check out. She's a red panda. Oh, she's awesome. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, she's got a very, very terrible workplace environment. So you might relate to that if you're in a workplace. It's very, it's like sexist. Sexist, and bullshit. Ego-driven, nasty, and yeah. So here, let me show uh, the coffee cup. You can do it because you have the other camera. Ooh. There it is. The light it's on the bottom. It's still very warm and it's cozy. Like I can imagine a nice cold winter day waking up and holding this and it's going to stay nice and warm the entire time. It is. I need one for Christmas. I know. We'll get you one. Uh, maybe, I mean, I don't know. Maybe, will I buy you one? I don't know. Dear Santa. Dear Santa, please give me an Ember mug. Uh, let's talk about uh, what else are you into? Anything else before we move um, on? I'm super into people voting. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> You just started a whole other conversation. I know, it's a whole other conversation. Well, we should, because this show's before the vote, right? Like, uh-huh. this will come out before the vote. Yeah, that's right. So, you all better vote in November. November 6th. Mm-hmm. And then here in Washington State, we can, our ballots are being sent out this upcoming Wednesday. They will be arriving in our mailboxes by October 22nd, and you've got, like, a couple weeks to actually fill it out. But you should fill it out right away and put it right in your mailbox without a stamp, because in King County... You don't need one. In Snohomish County, you don't need one. Yep. Yay! Yay! I remember that from last year. And, yeah. I, like, the, the, the vote count actually went way up, way up 
at the primaries a couple months ago because of the free stamps. Right. It's so funny how something simple like that can, yeah. yeah. If it's ma- you make it, make it easy, then people will do it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's very important this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so everybody go vote. Yes, vote, vote. Vote early, vote often. And, uh, yeah. Oh, jeez, Louise. Exercise our democracy while we have it. Vote for people who are not going to take our democracy away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who, again, I think we've mentioned it before on the show, but there's this kind of uh, ignorance is bliss that kind of floats around like, ah, you know, whatever. It's just politics. It isn't. It isn't politics the way it used to be because there's a per- specific person and other people around that person, uh, speaking of the GOP, uh, Republican mm-hmm. Party, that isn't really the Republican Party. It's essentially the Trump Party. Mm-hmm. Uh, this person, like... I've mentioned also before, is from New York. I'm from New York. We just know he's just a silly little ego-driven real estate guy who hasn't changed at all, and he's just a silly ego-driven real estate guy. Yeah. And so there's a bunch of people that kind of shows a mirror up to them that says, hey, when this kind of situation happens, because guess what? It did, and reality TV becomes the, the government, what yeah. will you do about it? And the answer... Like, this is too much fun. It's validating our our feelings, and it's okay to be angry and hate certain type of people and demonize people that we disagree with. That It's okay, and now I feel better about it. Right. It's really disturbing. Yeah, so that can happen, and uh, it really is about, you know, I think the biggest thing people say is like, well, don't just hate, you know, someone who likes Trump uh, specifically for that reason that they voted for them. You know, but the thing is, is a lot of people who didn't vote for him uh, do want to have a discourse. And a lot of people who did vote for him don't want to have a discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that that's the the problem there, because if you're saying, you know, you voted for him, you were confused. You didn't know what the hell was going on. You hated Hillary, blah, blah. Bernie didn't win. You were mad about that. But now let's have that discussion and really, you know, change something. Yeah. And, And that means that the other person on the other end who voted for Trump has to like, if you want to have that discussion, they have to care about you. Like, they have to kind of know you on a personal level and care about your life. And if you say, this is how I've been feeling since Trump has been elected, and this is why I'm afraid of, and this is, like, important to me because X, Y, Z, a lot of the reaction from those people are just to laugh at you and to call you, like, a sensitive snowflake or something. So, like, you can't even have that discourse because they just laugh, and then you present them with facts, and they double down on how they feel when presented with facts yeah. and, and just completely ignore it. Oh, it's fake media, like, fake news. Like, I don't need to pay attention to that because I just was told that it's all fake anyways. Yeah, and that whole term, by the way, like, that person created it. Yeah. Like, the Trump character, whatever he is— he created this idea to essentially start 1984, right? This idea right. of disinformation. Right. Like, trust me, I am I am your single source of information because you can't trust anything else. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you see parallels with um, Nazi Germany where they called it the Lugan Press, the um, lying press. And that's how they were able to monopolize, um, like, this really important megaphone. And you just, you wonder, and I always wonder, like, like how simple can people be to get fooled so easily? Yeah. You know, like uh, I think it, there's something to be said about that experiment that was done a while ago. Something about like if the group of people get too big, like problems start arising, mm-hmm. right? So if it's me and you and we're a country and I go, hey, you know, here's what happened. Like the apples fell from this tree, but it's okay. You know, we have like 10 left and whatever. Like I'm not going to lie to you. It's going to be tough to like pull off like – tricking you right we're like together we're doing this we're in it together potentially you know yeah there's eight people ten i forgot what the number is but at a certain point it gets like too big of a number and Mm -hmm. then bullshit happens right it's it's when one one party one side one cause ends up having a critical mass yeah and that's you know i think the gop is definitely in the minority right now but They're doing things to make sure that they stay in power, like gerrymandering and um, magically unregistering voters, like by the thousands. And by the way, we can't say that's because of voter fraud and like a fear of voter fraud. That is a false fear. I was just reading an article about all the different studies that have proven over and over again that voter fraud is is insignificant, minuscule. It's not even an issue. This is a made up issue to validate 
controlling the the voter roster, um, reducing people, um, reducing votes, because when people don't vote, then the GOP wins. When people vote, Democrats win. Right. Um, and again, yeah. it should be said that, um, and I've said this before, but Democrats and Republicans, it really isn't about that. It's about issues. Mm -hmm. It's about the people behind those issues, and that's it. Like, it's like, again, what issue we, we would decide as a small group, not a country. Let's just say we have a few people together. Hey, what are we going to do for the island? You know, hey, we're all going to think about, like, okay, we're only going to have, like, 10 coconuts a week or something, you know. But those mm -hmm. are the issues. Those are decisions you make. It has nothing to do with, like, oh, they're from the west side of the island or the east side of the island. It doesn't matter if you're blue or red. It matters, like, what you're saying. That's and so true. people get confused Because I'm, I'm not always happy about what the Democrats are doing. Oh, they do some crazy you know? stuff. And I often don't identify with the, with the Democrats either, but I identify with Democrats more often than I do Republicans Because it far. flows. Because it flows. You know what I mean? It changes. Yeah. Um, well, anyways, we could go down that uh, path, and we will. Yeah. Even some more later. Uh, but I think... I originally was like, what are you into? And we got into the vote. So, yeah, you're into the vote. You should be into the vote. And vote, November. Grab, grab a friend. Make sure that your friends are voting. <laughs> grab by the hand. Bring them. Yes. Come on, we're going. Ask them. I, I've been writing it on receipts at restaurants. Don't forget to vote November 6th. <laughs> video, video game pick real quick, Red Dead Redemption. Ooh. It's coming out soon, Red Dead Redemption 2. Two. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, Red Dead Red Dead. Dead Red. <laughs> yeah. sure that was years ago. It was years ago. And this new one is going to be incredible. So I'm wow. just kind of like saying that, hey, that's my pick, but I'm also going to be playing it very soon. What's the engine that was used to build it? I don't know. Uh, it's something brand new in the fact that they're really working on their AI. Mm. So a lot of the NPCs you can interact with in a much you know more detailed way. And these, you know, creating these systems like a Skyrim or something where you don't know what could happen because they just built a bunch of systems and you can kind of go play around that sandbox. So... Yeah, that is music to my ears, any sort of like real, you know, world. Which, by the way, we kind of maybe are in simulation because that's a whole other topic. Wow. I think we we're kind of in a video game. Getting into the metaphysics stuff now? I know. Let's talk about physics. Here we go. Perfect transition. Here's my book pick. It's Through Two Doors at Once, The Elegant Experiment That Captures the Enigma of Our Quantum Reality, which is a very Ooh. lengthy title. Wow. By Anil, and I'm not going to try to say his last name. Okay, well, Aneth's, Aneth's, Aunt, whoa. Can I try? You try. Not that I'm going to get Aneth's, it. Anil, Aneth Swami. Aneth Swami. Okay. Aneth Swami. That, that's, that's my it. best guess. Here's I'm so the, sorry uh, to I'll Mr. Put it to the camera. Yeah. Uh, there it is. And so what this book is great about is it's about the double slit experiment. Do you know about that? The what? double slit experiment? No, I don't know about this one. I'll give you the general idea, but what's cool is I know this experiment. I've been studying it for a long time. This book starts there. Now, why why that's so important is I'm about to tell you what it is. Yeah. It's a pretty mind-blowing experiment they did. I'm excited. Yeah, and the book starts there. So I've read so many of these books, quantum physics books, and you get halfway through and they're like, oh, they've done a lot of history a lot of like ancient stuff, Newton, we get it already, the apple fell. Yeah. But then they finally get to like the good shit. I'm always like, I look for the newest books because I want them to get to the new stuff. Yeah. So this book starts at one of the biggest experiments in science with quantum physics. And that's like the first chapter. So like the rest of it, I'm really excited about. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Can you sum up um, for people who don't know what quantum physics I are? Well, I, okay. Quantum physics is the study, uh, scientific study of the things that are small. Mm. That's the easiest way to understand quantum physics. Things that are beyond like the similar, like you think of atoms, uh, atoms are things that make up everything, right? Mm -hmm. So what's made, what, what makes up atoms? What makes up those quarks and protons and gluons and all the things that make up the things that we see in reality? And quantum physics is a study of those small things and how they interact and whatever. Mm -hmm. And in general, quantum physics doesn't make any sense because the minute you start studying the small, it just baffles the mind. It, it Things, particles go forward and backwards in time. They time travel 100%. They uh, jump from place to place, teleportation, which we can't even do really right now. But they do it all, and then they really do it all when we're not looking. Mm -hmm. So now I'll explain what the double slit experiment is. One more drink for my ember mug. <laughs> it's got a red light on the bottom. Does that mean oh, is it, maybe it's recharged? battery? Thank you for telling me that. You're welcome. It's still warm, though. So, Good. It's hey, still they, going. they have a little bit of a leeway time. Woohoo. I got to charge with Ebert Mug. So, here's the double slit experiment quickly. Okay. 
So basically, um, think of a piece of paper with two holes in it. And on the bottom, there's kind of like a detector plate. You're like seeing what's going to come through the two holes, okay? Okay. So it's a piece of paper or a piece of water, doesn't matter. Two like thin little slits. So in the general sense of like the kind of physical reality that we know, let's say it's sand. And we're going to pour sand through those two holes, right? Right. All at once, a bunch of them, right? They'll fall through the two holes and they'll make basically in the bottom of that through the through the slits, they'll make these two heaps where the two holes are. Logically, it would make sense. They kind of make these kind of concave little, you know, mounds, right? right? Yeah. Through the two holes, direct shot, because that's what they are, the little particles. Just, and then they just kind of they collapse kinda... on and create a mountain. Right. Yeah. So that if you did the same type of thing in a kind of a more macroscopic level, it was like a hole, two holes, and you threw a baseball through. You know, you'd expect that baseball to go right through and hit the detector point at the end is a straight shot. That's a particle. Well, what they decided, what they found, they didn't decide, they found is when they did that with small particles, quantum style particles, um, light is made of photons. So they're little teeny particles like a baseball, miniature baseball, it's like. And it's a little particle called a photon. So they shot a bunch of photons through that. Mm -hmm. And what they saw on the back wasn't a regular dot, dot, dot like they would think. Yeah. They saw an interference pattern, which is basically like a pattern like waves. So it looked like it was reacting like a wave in the back. Yet we shot them right through the two little holes. So you would think they would just kind of clump up like the sand. But they didn't. Yeah. They they behave like a water wave like a, with this interference pattern. Google interference pattern, listeners, and you'll see what it, what it looks like. So they were like, well, that doesn't make any sense because we shot them. They're little particles, you know? Yeah. So what they did is they looked at the slits when they did it. So they actually like put a detector or a camera. They're like, what's happening? Because if, if what is happening on the back end is to be believed, then what is really happening is those particles are like separating and like becoming split and going through both of the holes at the same time. So what's interfering with it for it to They be were split? interfering with themselves. Oh. Wow. Which doesn't make any sense. Wrap my head around this. Right. Well, here, before, just before you wrapped your head around it, that doesn't make any sense, right? It yeah. means they split and they did that, but Something right? has to has to um, cause that. Like, they can't just randomly split. What it appeared is that they did it themselves. So what they did is they put a camera at the slit and said, hey, okay, let's see what the fuck's happening, right? Yeah. And the minute they put the camera there, it acted like the two mounds and acted like a particle. And it didn't do the wave thing. They took the camera away and it acted like a wave again. So our looking at it changed the the reality, changed the actual matter. So so but what if it's the observer, right? It is. It's it, the it really observer. Was. So yeah. it's not the it's not the 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 particles that were changing, but it was the observer looking at it. But the particles were changing due to the, what the observer was looking at it. So we are, it's called collapsing the wave function. That's what they call it in quantum wow. physics. So our looking at it changed its property. So when we don't look at it, it it's a wave. And it's like, yeah, I'm a wave. And I act like a wave and, it, and I do the interference pattern. When I look at it, it acts like a particle because we looked at it. Oh, so it's kind of like when you, when you're when you're looking not looking at someone and they're picking their nose like in their car and then you look over at them and they see you looking at them and then they pull their finger out of their nose well. I don't know <laughs> if it's that but I'm going to say yes because it's like oh god they're looking at me yeah, yeah. Shit, before it was fine before it was fine before it was a wave pattern I was an interference pattern <laughs> act, act normal yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> So, yeah. so what? So, so how do proton or ph photon? Are we it was photons, but here's photons. the thing. Here's the kicker of that. The final part of that yeah. uh, blowing your mind thing is they did that same experiment with atoms, full atoms. Okay, which Act are bigger than much bigger than a photon. Yeah, there are all the different particles, nucleus, electron, blah blah blah, and they did the same thing. What? And we're made of atoms. So we change when other people look at us. There, like the whole idea that we started with a little bit on this talk, even or maybe in pre-podcast, but energy, we talked about it. Mm -hmm. That's why I believe it so, so strongly. It's literally proven by science that, you know, us looking at things change the physical properties of those things. And they did an experiment, which I might have mentioned before, but in Japan where they had water in these two um, 
uh, like capsules or whatever, and that one water said love and the other water said hate. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and they changed the properties of those water by people looking at it. So, so. They, they haven't been able to explain why. I don't know. Like it's Mine not in the book? stuff. <laughs> That's, so there's no explanation in the book. It's just. Well, the book starts with that. That's what's so good about the book. Oh. Through two doors at once. Oh, Check it out. That's that's the title. Yeah. <laughs> now you see there it is. Yeah. And look look at the, the cover of it is like the interference pattern kind of. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. so now I see the interference pattern. Anywho, there's my thing about science. You were going to talk to me about quantum physics because I was like, let's talk about it. Oh yeah, I what, love quantum physics, even though I haven't been able to read about it in a while. Being what, what's something that you remember from it, or why you were so fascinated by it? I'm fascinated by it because it's the. Um, it feels like it's it's the point where science meets spirituality, right? It's mm. kind of that. It's that gray area where it's this fuzzy stuff that we can't explain. It's there's something there. There's something. Um, I am, I am. I was baptized a Christian, but I am. I don't identify as one. I'm. I identify as an agnostic, and that's not an invitation for people to convert me, which a lot of people see that as an invitation. But it's me, um, genuinely believing that I. I think that there's something out there, and we can't explain it because I am just this one person, and I, I can't know everything about that's that's mystical and unknowable about the universe. Mm-hmm. We can just kind of observe amazing things happening from day to day or from like a feeling or, you know, being tea high or, you know, we're talking about photons splitting and learning about that, but we can't completely explain it because every time we get smaller and smaller, we like in, in, in on this microcosm, there's more questions. Right. And it's like, but that's science too. It's science that there's something amazing there. It's science, but it's also goes back to, um, Kind of like some Christian stuff because I remember hearing early on from something. I think it was a book. It wasn't like my parents or something because I was brought up a little Christian Adventist as well. Mm. Um, And I I read this somewhere, but it was like, oh, so God doesn't want you to know what that stuff is. That was the explanation. (laughs) Because like if there was a creator, right? Let's go back to the kind of thing I alluded to about how we might be in a simulation. Video games. We might be in a video game. That's a question. But if... Someone made a video game and someone made a, and you're a god, you made a whole, you know, thing, which is a universe and people and stuff. You would probably like, you know, make some nice blocks so they couldn't see everything because you wouldn't want them to like get into the good shit. Yeah. Right. Like, I don't want you to figure it out really how we did this because then it's almost like it would be found out or something, you know? Mm -hmm. So I remember early on someone saying, like, well, you know what? Carlos, you guys can do all that science stuff you want, but you're going to keep seeing nothing. Be- and, and what's weird is it's kind of true because past quantum physics, which I also study, is string theory. Past string theory is this thing called eight dimension theory. Like you can't even, you can't even imagine what that is. Well, I could. I could talk oh, to can you. you. Yeah, for <laughs> wow. like hours about it. And it's incredible and it kind of makes sense. But are it, does it make sense? And is there real reality or are we just keep? explaining it to ourselves huh that's interesting that's where i that's where i live right now like that's my crux that i've got to of all the reading all the research uh i still go like that's pretty interesting but also are we just telling ourselves stories right how do you how do you really know it's um yeah <laughs> it's god's will yeah <laughs> it might just be Whoa. god's will i um i don't know yeah so i i love i love quantum the the whole quantum physics thing but have a lot to learn yet about it yeah well let's do it we'll do it on the show well we should have a reading list a lot of things podcast reading list oh yeah good idea they do that like oprah has a freaking book club or whatever that's right a lot of things book club this is the first one through two doors at once okay through two doors sounds great uh to end the podcast because we're way over time (laughs) i thought so (laughs) all right here's a question and answers for you the first one i had was are we in a simulation oh are we in a simulation? But a simulation means that somebody is actively observing us. Okay. Yeah. Yes and no. Like, no, because this is, I don't believe that this is an entire, I mean, it goes back to the whole God thing, right? But I don't think that there's something that's actively organizing and observing us. But yes, there are things that are observing us and collecting data on us every single day from so many sources. Like, Obviously, on this planet. On this planet. Yeah. Like, like I mean, there's data, like, about, you know, tracking my GPS to get here. There's social media that we're constantly posting on. I just listened to a, um, 
uh, NPR segment on the way here about how there's health apps that can take your data, but the, your your health data is now proprietary and they own it because mm. they collected it and so they can resell it. You know, so it's just like, so yeah, we're also kind of sort of being tracked, I guess, in a, some, some sort of a simulation to somebody else's benefit as All well. Right. Your answer is that we are in a simulation of data that is already happening yeah. by companies. That's true. Okay, that's your answer. And then my second question is... And this one's a big one. I didn't think we would already go too long, so these were like big questions. <laughs> no. But I'll ask one more. Okay. Um, is, oh, this is a big one. Maybe I should skip it for the easier one. Okay, uh, I'll ask the harder one because I, I feel like you'll have a good answer. Okay. So here, So here's my issue. So people think things that are cheap aren't worth anything. Like when you see like, uh, I used to do records and stuff. If, you, if I saw my indie album at like four ninety nine, they'd be like, oh, that's a piece of shit. I'm not going to buy it. It's not like the regular fourteen ninety nine album. So I shouldn't care about it. Mm-hmm. Same thing happens with videos that have 28 views on them. People go like, oh, well, that's obviously nothing I should care about because it's not 20,000 views, right. you know, but you watch something that's in that natural algorithm in Google and YouTube and they're like, oh, this is what, 195,000 views? Oh, I'll click on it. Mm-hmm. So they immediately think that. Is that from something about human fear? Like like some sort of like reptilian brain thing where like, oh, let's not get close to the thing that sucks or is wimpy or, you know, this kind of like strength and, and like non-strength then because it, cause I'm afraid that that's going to bring me down in some way. That's the only thing I can think oh, of. That's interesting. Because if not, then it just sucks for anybody who creates things in any platform because the minute you start in with cheap or small views or whatever it is, people go like, well, that's not good enough. That's amazing because what constitute as as popular on the internet does not necessarily mean that it's good. Right. You know, which I think you were getting at. Like I've... I've spent, I think, some of my most well-researched blog posts that I am the most proud of, that are the most well-crafted, most thoughtful, did not get nearly as many views as the ones that I just kind of slapped together, you know, that were funny and weird and wonky and I didn't spend as much time on, but it was just kind of weird and funny and entertaining, right? Right. So it's, I think it's, people are, it's a status thing. You know, people are afraid that if they don't keep up with other people, like their status drops somehow, it makes mm. them an outlier, and that leaves you more exposed on a primal level. Like you're not part of the group. Part of the group. But if you're going to spend your time, like you want to be part of the group. You want to survive. Group. Yeah. Be like relatable and know how to relate to things, and you want to feel a part of that group. But that group is potentially, with like say a YouTube, is kind of controlled. And, you know, the self-propagated and whatever, like they have these algorithms just say like, okay, well, this is successful. Now we're going to put it in this thing. And so then that's like you're part of a group that's being controlled already. It's true. You're not, you're not picking the group that is potentially the strongest or potentially the best or most right. interesting or educating. It's you're, you're part of the group that's just being chosen for you. It's true. And also a lot of it has to do with emotion too right so after the last um, presidential election we keep bringing up politics but after the last mm. presidential election it made me you know, reevaluate what news sources am i actually reading like what kind of quality of information am i reading and the stuff that is the most popularly shared is the easy meme like mm-hmm. meme meme <laughs> type stuff that's digestible and quick and emotional makes you angry but then the stuff that actually matters is is the long form well researched content that people don't want to sit and read because they don't they're afraid of like spending their time they don't have time to think about it to process right. it my question is, is that has that always been has that been in the you know prehistoric days has it been in the medieval days has it been in those times where like you know the same kind of group mentality happened i wonder I think it gets back to a primal survival thing. Gosh, damn it. Yeah. I want to change even that. I was telling my friend the other day, I was like, I, I want to change our makeup. Mm-hmm. Like, if we're talking about reality and the fact that we can change it mm-hmm. by just literally looking at it and, ch- and changing how we feel and energy, we should be able to change even those basic things. That we can. can. It's the neural pathways. You can right. change your neural pathways, but it's 
it's a lot of intentional work. Right. You have to change your habits. That was one of my most popular blog posts was how oh, to nice. change any habit using video or game mechanics. Nice. That was actually a really interesting article. That put I a enjoyed. link in that. We'll put a link in the show notes. You send it to me because it's yeah, still relevant. It is. And that's your thing. All that stuff's still relevant. Like people are so quick to go to the next thing. Right. It's like we'll just go back to that thing that was a couple years ago. You know what I mean? And it's still like really us in good. the business. We call it evergreen content. It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> this is I, this. I try to make this podcast actually evergreen. If you go back and listen, to, yeah, we talk about new shows in quotes, new for us at the moment. Yeah. But if you've never seen Outlander or whatever, yeah. right now you might still check it out. Right. So we are way done. Lauren okay. Hell Cyrus, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. My mocha is still warm, mm. even though the battery has died. I think I've done no, with it. No, it's still going. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, it's still red. Mm hmm. Ember.com, check them out. Also, mm-hmm. uh, It's A Lot of Things on Instagram, instagram.com slash it's a lot of things. Uh, also, I'm going to be housekeeping real quick. I'm going to do PRGE, which is the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. Going down there for a day, and I'm going to meet with Tommy Tallarico, oh. who is launching in television or relaunching in television, which is an old game system. So I was, I've met, I've met Tommy because he was dating someone who me and 50, uh, three or four other women 15 years ago started um, a women in gaming group. And what? she was the girlfriend of Tommy Tallarico at the time. Weird. So I'm already like somewhat familiar with him okay. through that way. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Small world. Yeah. Video game world is a very small world. It is. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to talk to him about Intellivision. And then the next podcast is Adam from Game to Grow. And then I'm going to a global games forum conference, and we'll talk about that. And Geek Girl Con is at the end yes. of this month. So check that out, geekgirlcon.com or uh, .org? It might be .org, and it's October 27th and 28th at the Washington State Convention Center. Check it out. Woo. Lauren, where are you on the on the internet? Do you want, want anybody to find you anywhere? Sure. My um, my Twitter account, my regular business Twitter account is uh, at Hall Steigerts, H-A-L-L-S-T-I-G-E-R-T-S. My T Twitter account is... T Voyeur. Oh yeah, that's right. T E A V O Y E U R. Um and Pictures I'm on of tea. Instagram, mostly on Instagram with yeah. T. Is that also T Voyeur? Yes, it's yeah, also yeah. T Voyeur. Hey, I like pictures of tea. It yeah. gets me wanting to have some more. Yeah, I'm makes me excited. It. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, that's it. The count of the show's over. <laughs> It's over. It's over. What's that from? <laughs> that was from... Um... Oh, Strong Bad. Yeah, Strong Bad. Oh, <gasps> That's so good. You know they have a board game? I didn't know that. Yeah, they just came out. They're just coming out with a board game. Oh, Hopefully, right amazing. Now. It's over. It's over. <laughs> All right, it's over. <laughs>